Hello, I'm Greg Daphner, President of the Asia Pacific Satellite Communications Council, APSCC, and the CEO of GAPSET. We're here today to talk about universal access, even more required during and after the COVID-19 crisis. So, first of all, there are a lot of ways to talk about universal access. First of all, the definition varies from country to country, ranging from plans for connecting villages in emerging markets to making sure that everyone has broadband with the definition of broadband changing and expanding over time. Some of you are probably familiar with the United Nations eight millennium development goals, which were established in 2000, and then the follow up with the 2015 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which expanded the list to 17 goals. Unfortunately, none of either set of high level goals directly included information and communication technology, ICT, let alone satellite communications. But we were incorporated into the broad infrastructure goals of both. When the United Nations talks about universal access, it focuses on bridging the digital divide and creating digital inclusion. Broadly, this includes five elements, affordable, robust broadband internet services, internet enabled devices that meet the needs of users, access to digital lit literacy training, quality technical support and applications and online content designed to enable and encourage self-sufficiency, participation and collaboration. Traditionally, digital inclusion was considered to be a question of having or not having network access. But with global mobile phone penetration at over 95%, it is becoming a relative inequality between those who have more and less bandwidth and more or fewer skills. Universal access can be viewed from the consumer or the provider perspective. For the user, it's how do we bridge the digital divide and ensure that communications is as widely available as possible. From the provider's perspective, there are a variety of technical and business issues, but when we focus on the word access, it is what the legal constraints are imposed on entering a national market and are we allowed to provide network infrastructure and services in a reasonable fashion. Today's panel will examine to what extent can universal access be provided in a profitable manner by satellite versus to what extent it will be driven by subsidies, possibly under a form of universal service obligation, a USO. That is, should satellite broadband pay its own way or be subsidized? Should governments fund the setup or should it be left to commercial entities to take the initiative? And if so, will that delay rollout? Our panelists today are Andrew Walwyn, the CEO of Big Blue Broadband, Renato Goodfellow, head of global satellite at BT Telecom, Mauricio Segovia, CEO of Access Networks, Bing Kung, extraterrestrial product manager, I love that, extraterrestrial product manager at Facebook, and last but certainly not least, Adi Adiwaso, CEO of PSN. So. Let's start out by asking each of our panelists, okay, thank you. what are your views on all this? And specifically, what are your companies doing to expand universal access today? And what are your plans for the future? Renato, you're in my upper left-hand mm -hmm. corner. Why don't you go first? <laughs> Thank you, Greg, a pleasure. And yes, for me, in British Telecom, the universal service obligation seems so much so important, and I'm pleased to say aligned with our core values, because whilst we provide residential service in the UK and enterprise, and follow our global enterprise customers to other parts of the world, 
What I like so much is our positive aim is wherever we go, whatever we do, we want to make a positive contribution to the lives of the people in the countries where we do business. Okay. Mauricio. We can't hear you. I was muted. Hello, everybody. Mauricio Segovia, CEO of Access Networks. Uh, glad to be here. Thank you for, for the invitation and, and glad to, to be made part of this panel. Uh, we, we are a service provider in the Americas, in Africa, and the Middle East, uh, mostly providing services to enterprises. Uh, we do participate in some universal services projects and programs you no know, by 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 in, in, in the regions where we where we we have a presence there's a lot of that going on a lot of government sponsored universal services programs uh, we 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 participate in some of them although our core our core business and our core focus is is providing services satellite communication services to to uh, enterprises but there we we do work with government and, and in many cases, uh, via the work we do with government, uh, we ended up you now helping uh, 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 close uh, the digital the digital divide. We tend to stay away from the larger uh, universal universal services programs because of the complexity, and we believe that our our capabilities are not necessarily aligned with what's required in those programs. But we do participate in those via government initiatives. And, and, and smaller local government programs. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew, you're next. Later than never. Um, yes, Andrew Wolwin, CEO of um, Big Blue Broadband. Uh, we are a rural broadband ISP. We cover Europe and Australia, uh, very much dealing with the end user customer. Um, the two technologies we use are satellite, um, and also fixed wireless products. And, and we do chase government funding. So obviously in Australia, NBN Cove is very much funding the satellite market. And across Europe as well, there are different uh, funds that give access to grants to reduce that cost of entry to the end user. Um, and, and obviously fill in that gap where fiber doesn't reach. Thanks. Thank you. And Adi, your turn. Thank you, Greg. Uh, PSN has been doing universal service obligation, which is considered by the government of Indonesia as an affirmative action. So since last three years ago, the goal is to provide before the end of 2025, the connectivity for 78,000 villages, 200,000 schools, and more than 10,000 health centers. And considered by the government of and So the situation is that uh, we provide uh, satellite capacity for the backhaul to the government, which in case provide a free backhaul to the cellular companies. We also provide wireless uh, services to the villages. Uh, it's free. The services, it's free, born by the government. And uh, to the, for the back. Can you hear me clearly? Hello? I hear you. Okay. So well, currently the government is using more than 20 gigabits per second already. And by mid next year, they will be use more than 35 gigabits per second satellite only. They also <laughs> provide uh, fiber optics. They build fiber optics to the rural areas. Also uh, other terrestrial means. Uh, the government have decided that the, this digital divide has to be eradicated. So they basically put a massive effort to this. We won the first PPP, public-private partnership with the government, which will construct 150 gigabits per second spacecraft to be launched in 2023. 
the whole capacity will be taken by the government of Indonesia to provide free internet services into the rural and schools. And it is, uh, therefore, we need to make sure we provide an extremely economical means to do so. So that's what we're doing in Indonesia and what we're doing today. Thank you, Adi. Um, why don't I follow up with you? Um, our last our last panelist does not seem to be here um, from Facebook, but maybe he'll jump in. Um, so is all of the service that PSN is providing today and for the foreseeable future with the launch of your next satellite in 2023, is it all being done for a single customer, the government, or do you also have programs and the provision of services directly for, for other users? Currently, the government is the largest user. We actually have services to enterprise as well as uh, Wi-Fi breakout, which they pay the quota. We now have about 15,000 locations already across the nation, which is paying to us, while the government has more than 20,000 locations providing free. Uh, the free services are for school, village administration, and health center. So if you wanted to do your private internet, you have to pay for the quota. So it's a combination thereof. We at PSN today, uh, basically still maintaining 60% to the government and 40% to the to the and a commercial site. Um, thank you. And just to be clear, in terms of how the services are delivered to the end users, is it direct to um, to schools, and then through direct that is to a earth station on a school, and then wired or wireless to desktop computers, laptops, and phones within the school or other facilities, or, or what? Uh, it is directly, we put a broadband terminal, and we have a Wi-Fi breakout for the school or in the village center. And people can also go there after school to use it for free. Okay. And also, uh, but the village uh, administrations and the health, I think they will be using for them. I like to touch with the uh, health center. There is now an urgent uh, program to provide 3,000 uh, uh, health center to prepare to provide the COVID vaccine distributions early next year. So, and the logistics, the administrations, as well the reporting. So we are actually quite busy now. We have to finish 3,000 locations in quite remote places within the next 60 days. So uh, I assume that that's you're like you have an army of uh, of installers and technicians, is, is or what? We have created, for a long, long time. We have created uh, a training center a vocational training center, which the government has. We train them to install, and some of them that are good, we hire as our technicians. But uh, in some of the other areas, we will we just giving them a contract to uh, install, uh, operate, and the gentleman who we hired will have the responsibility to make sure it maintains and make sure that it's installed properly. So we have thousands of them across the nation. The most difficult today because of COVID is the uh, delivery. Uh, planes are uh, not going as normal. Transportation is not going normal. Shipping, boats are not going in a normal way. So we see that delay occurring uh, uh, that. But the government wants to make sure that 150,000 location will be done by 2024. You're on mute, Greg. I cannot hear you. Yes, you're still muted, Greg. There's a problem. <laughs> no, no, I think I'm not muted now. Um, okay, sorry about that. Uh, it must be an automatic thing that people just do to me. Um, 
So, Ani, the, the 150 gigabits that you're going to be launching on the next satellite, just to put it into perspective, and we're talking about a country with, what is it, 17,000 islands, um, a, a lot of areas that are not currently served. As you say, that there are going to be hundreds of thousands of new locations. Is 150 giga, gigabits going to meet the requirements, or is that the tip of the iceberg and, and there will be required to have even more capacity in a short time thereafter. A plan to add more capacity. The issue here, what we call it, the terrestrial uh, is also uh, uh, encroaching. The uh, fiber optic is growing. The digital terrestrial uh, long range microwave is also going and being tested now uh, over the horizon is all those things to overcome the geographical issues. Uh, it's easier to put fibers in the ocean rather than going through the land uh, because uh, roads are not built, uh, uh, especially in the eastern part of Indonesia. But 150 gigs plus all the other, uh, our other spacecraft uh, is not enough. Uh, we are actually considering now to launch another spacecraft prior to the government spacecraft of approximately another 150 gig. That we will provide about 300 uh, plus gigabits per second to Indonesia. And uh, it's not gonna be easy to, be, to do that because the government is requesting to be sub $100 per megabits per second per month. Okay, challenging. Um, thank you. Andrew, <laughs> Deep Blue Broadband, I love the name. I have heard that you're selling your UK and European satellite broadband operations to Utilsat. Is this true? What's the status? Uh, or is it just yeah, that, 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 that's very true. That, that, that deal happened back in September and uh, will be concluding probably towards the end of this month. Um, very much based around the fact that Utilsat, new satellite that's gone up, uh, Connect, uh, the first of their, their two, uh, a very good satellite, speeds of 100 meg, uh, very, very strong tariffs across Europe uh, and Africa. And Utilsat is accelerating its direct to market program. And um, what else to do in Europe, obviously, than, than buy the number one kind of satellite retailer? is what Big Blue was. So it's really accelerated the process there for, for Utilsat. Okay, so to put it into perspective, so that at least our American colleagues can appreciate it, is the Utilsat move to, to buy you and your distribution arm, basically, um, similar to when Viasat bought Wild Blue years ago to, to go directly to customers? Uh, it, there is a comparison there. I think the difference was uh, is that while Blue did actually have their own satellite, whereas we have always been uh, a, a reseller, a distributor, different terminologies used in different parts of the world. But right. we owned that relationship with the end user, the end user customer. So, um, right. you know, the, the base that was existing, over 50,000 customers, sort of 90% of those were re, um, residential properties. Uh, and 10% uh, B2B. So it really just gives the usual set that immediate entrance into the marketplace of the footprint for the Connect satellite. Yeah. Um, well, and to drill down a little bit, a lot of people think that the, the story that Adi was telling us about a developing country with large um, parts of its population in need of first uh, first broadband services. Um, how widespread are the unserved or underserved areas, the terrestrial underserved areas in Europe? I mean, is it a significant market, a growth market, or is it a dwindling opportunity that will disappear? Okay, I think fiber is growing. There is no doubt about it that uh, and you know we need to tackle that head on but there is still a very large market and i think the real difference now uh, and why i think the satellite market is expanding in europe is quite simply the product 
now matches the requirements of the customer. And, and if we look at, say, for instance, what, what Connect is providing over that footprint, what we can see is that, um, you know, the, the, the speeds have now reached something that is comparable to um, terrestrial and also the amount of capacity that each person is getting. It's unthinkable to something that was, I don't know, 36 months ago that that package wasn't there. So I think that is what is driving that market, along with obviously fixed wireless um, products as well. So the, the product has come of age and that's the real difference for the market that, we're, that uh, we, we play in. And when you say that the um, capacity is comparable to uh, terrestrial today, um, the satellite capacity uh, with this new technology, how about the pricing? Uh, I mean, I guess cost and pricing for the services you're offering. Is it competitive, um, equal to, better than? How would you characterize it versus? I would say to, to terrestrial. Yeah, yeah, I think it's you're, you're always going to uh, pay a slight premium over your typical terrestrial um, offering. Um, and, and I don't know, if we, if we take an example of that in the UK, maybe it's five pounds more, or if it's a Euro country, it's something like five pounds, five euros more. So that premium people are willing to pay because there are no other sort of offerings that are actually current that, that can fix that. Fiber is never gonna reach the areas that we are targeting. There is always going to be five to 10% of, of the footprint that we operate in, in Europe or, or Australia, that won't get fiber. Uh, and there is this acceptance now that um, there are alternative products to get there. I think when it's talking about subsidies from government though, what we need to is ensure that they, they recognize that these products will do the job and not set the parameters to the, the grants or subsidies so that um, our industries are, are not included. Right. Um, and just a clarification, the Australian operations are also being purchased or have been no, purchased? No, no, no. It's, 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 uh, Big Blue has got a few parts of its business. We have our Australian operation, which is very much uh, under the SkyMesh brand, um, which is something like 90% satellite, 10% uh, fixed wireless. We also then have two fixed wireless networks in the UK and in the Norwegian market. So those, those still remain part of Big Blue PLC. It's very much the satellite broadband footprint that we had in Europe. Gotcha. All right. Well, thank you. Um, Renato, talking about Europe, let's, it's a natural segue. Um, I remember the BT satellite operations very well. In fact, my wife spent years working for BT, and uh, in fact, it's one of the reasons we're together today. But Good. that's a personal yeah. note. <laughs> um, can you tell us, really, you know, some some detail? What kind of a what kind of satellite services you're providing, and in particular, what kind of digital divide type services? Is it focused in the countryside? in the UK or is it beyond or, or what? It's a very good point, Greg, because being very open and honest as always, of course, in the UK, I find every time we say, is there an opportunity to use satellite in the access network? Some of my colleagues say, maybe we should look again at the business case to roll out fiber regardless. So I think that is positive. Every time satellite looks as though it's more competitive, we have another go at making fiber even to the remote parts cost in. But also we've looked at how 4G business case is more than more attractive for rural parts. And in some cases, even using satellite for a rural area, but then fanning out with 4G connectivity. Okay. Do you expect that 4G to be replaced by 5G or is it good enough and actually serves the, the requirements and there's no need to, to migrate? Yeah, it's a very good question, Greg. And I think for the engineers amongst us, the thought would be, of course, when you go higher in frequencies to 5G, you shorten the range. So 4G, lower frequencies, greater reach. So we see 4G so much more complementary for the rural areas and 5G where you have the really, really heavily loaded cities with more base stations. 
Okay. Um, and you mentioned, I think, the uh, universal service obligation mm -hmm. that your company um, in particular um, works under. Are you uh, a recipient, is BT a recipient of subsidies to provide some of these services? How does it work? Yeah, that is always a very good discussion with our government, and I believe most of the time now there aren't subsidies, but then I feel it takes a good proactive business mind to say you can make the corporate and social connectivity work. Because if I give you an example in the UK, I was really amazed during this COVID period in helping serve the local community to find there's another group we forget, even in the developed countries, that feel underserved with connectivity, that is the elderly. And I was told that where they can't have family visiting, they can't travel, they're in lockdown, they need that connectivity, and many have been encouraged by family. There's a smartphone, we've given you one. Then they say, we've got no wireless, we've got no connectivity. But as BT, I've started discussion with some of the health industry in the UK to say, well, part of reducing the costs of looking after the elderly must be how wearable devices provide telemetry that cut down doctor visits, cut down national health service costs. So I believe there, if you really put some thought to it, there's ways of harnessing requirement that spends money to be satisfied like care for the elderly community and say you can provide service that also gives broadband and helps them to feel connected for everything else they need to do. Okay, but I'm listening to the tense you're using and it sounds to me like you're talking about possible future opportunities rather than current provision of those services. Am I getting it right? Yes, only because, Greg, I saw this opportunity supporting my local community through COVID when we had some community meetings with the elderly groups that support that part of the community that will be part of one day. And they were saying the loneliness, the contact they need. So I put that two and two together, spoke to some of the health industry sector of my own company, said, yes, there's a point there, could we bring the two together, the benefit for the health services with a way of providing that connectivity to the elderly anyway? Okay, thank you. And turning to Mauricio, um, you said that you're working in the Americas, I, I guess that's principally Latin America, um, Africa and the Middle East. Can you describe to us some of the uh, the rural universal access services that you are providing and where and how are you uh, delivering those services? Um, I mean, there's plenty of programs in, in both regions, especially in Latin America. Most of the governments in the Latin American region have universal programs in place and, and, uh, and there is uh, uh, no yearly large bits uh, to to roll out those universal programs. Normally, we don't participate out of those. Uh, we've we've chosen over our history not to participate in those type of projects. We believe that we don't have the capabilities required to to do them well. Uh, uh, so our work in, in 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 universal programs normally tends to be behind uh, a, a, another player. No, that integrates uh, us into their solution. So it's a player that might be, they might win one of those large projects, does a lot of it you know, with their own infrastructure, does a lot of it with some uh, satellite connectivity and integrates us into that part of the solution. Uh, but we don't, do, we don't tend to do it ourselves in, 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 in those cases. We, we, we believe that our, our know-how and our capabilities are better focused on serving uh, you no know, corporate and customers with high you no know, uh, requirements of, 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 of use. We do participate in with universal service obligations. There are, there's many countries where as part of, of your license to be able to operate in those countries, you need to uh, pay funds to the universal service obligation. And we do participate as well with, we have a large, a very large, uh, 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 cellular backhaul networks with different operators and, and, and many of those networks today are being used to provide not traditional 
no phone to cell site connectivity, but they are used as as back backbones to to provide what uh, Renato was talking about, 4G type of fixed solutions in, in in rural areas, and we have a lot of those. But again, that's behind somebody else. No, it's behind an MNO, and not us doing it directly, or not us fronting the project directly. So um, I had heard that one of the areas that you excel in is the resale of Intelsat Epic capacity. Is, is that correct? And are you providing end-to-end -end managed services or just raw capacity to the Celcos, for example, or both, or or one? We we use we use raw capacity. We tend to use raw capacity of of Epic, no, of some of the Epic satellites, but. But we also use other operators, but Epic is one of our of our main of our main uh, uh, providers, in, especially in the Americas. Uh, and we okay. use rock capacity, rock capacity to provide managed end-to-end -end services to different corporate players and to seller or backhaul uh, and seller or backhaul solutions to MNOs. Okay, thank you. Um, let's shift gears a little bit here and actually go to the the second half of our of our focus panel, um, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the ITU recently reported that one of the pandemic challenges has been the massive shift in broadband usage from urban office buildings towards sur suburbs and uh, rural areas where people now are telecommuting from their homes. Uh, the UN recently reported that with school closures, in 191 countries, approximately 1.5 billion children were out of school this year due to COVID. And more importantly, I guess, half the total number of students kept out of the classroom by the pandemic um, do not have access to a household computer. And the number, I think, was 43% have no internet at home at a time when digitally-based distance learning is used to ensure educational continuity in at least the majority of these countries. According to UNESCO, disparities are particularly acute in low-income companies, countries. Um, in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, 89% of students don't have access to a household computer and 82% lacked um, internet access. Nevertheless, According to the ITU, internet traffic tripled during the pandemic. So, gentlemen, what shifts in demand and service expansion are you seeing in satellite traffic and services? And have you found that COVID has driven an increase in satellite utilization? And if so, is this reflected more in retail or in wholesale satellite usage? Who wants to go first? I can talk about firstly, um, uh, initially, the uh, I suppose Australia and Europe. There's no doubt okay. about it. Um, with my big blue hat on, we, we saw business climb like we've never seen in the 12 years history uh, of the company. Uh, lots more subscriptions as people moved out of the city in, into to rural areas. So huge growth in customer numbers. And we also saw huge consumption of data, you know, really big, big jumps. Uh, in what people are consuming. And, and I think it's fair to say that there has been a, 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 a big shift as people do work from home. I, and I don't think post COVID, whether that's spring, summer, when that comes, I, I don't think we will see the full return to work that we, the, the, the pre COVID time. So I think um, there has been a shift to more rural areas. I think what we also see from my experience with uh, Utilsat and Connect, I do see a big rise uh, in, in take up in Africa. You know, the feedback getting from there is that, um, yeah, it, it's a similar sort of rise to what we are seeing in, in Europe uh, and Australia. Um, however, obviously, the, the size is slightly different. The, the amount of people, that, what they're spending is, is lower. But I think across the board, I would imagine all of us on here are going to say that we've seen a big rise in business. Okay. Mauricio, did you want to uh, reflect yeah, what we, you're 
we've we've also seen a large rise in 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 consumption, and we've seen we've seen no we we, we took direct hits from from COVID in terms of of, of customers. Uh, Closing down businesses and all that, but the the ones that that uh, continue to 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 purchase our services are using more, you no, know? and that, that's across the board, and and that's that's clear because people are more and more working from from dif different places than from the office, and and uh, a lot more uh, work done via you no know, the the Zoom conferencing and and what we're doing today. Uh, so there's there's a lot more more consumption. No, in 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 our case, uh, the the more consumption of of customers compensated for the loss of customers that we had from direct impact of customers that were affected and, and had to close down operations or 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 or, or close down their business and, and therefore we lost some business. Okay, um, so it hasn't been the growth that Andrew was describing so much. It's been growth with the customers that we keep. Uh, there, for sure, the usage has gone up. But we, I mean, we we compensated uh, a business that we lost with customers that we lost with with that growth. Okay. Um, Adi, what's your experience? And one thing Renato reminded me of is when you describe it. How does the government actually fund money for your project? I mean, what's what's the mechanism? Um, I think Renato wants to get in on a good deal. Adi, you're on mute. Uh, yeah. Uh, since about 10 years ago, the government has levied tax revenue tax on each telecom operator about 1.75% of its revenue, okay? Before COVID, they are only capable to do that, okay? Uh, and that really limit, limited the capability uh, of the government to be able to break uh, the isolations of many rural areas and locations. So the government decided that they will relocate the funding from the other telecom revenues, such as license fee, annual frequency fees, to be able to do this. So the, suddenly the government redirected the funds uh, and allowing the Minister of Finance allowing almost 90% of the uh, revenue that is related to the information telecom market to be used to break this digital divide. So it is almost like a self-serving situation, uh, and and we really uh, we see a, a massive growth. Uh, we launched a satellite last year in February, and by February this uh, coming year, uh, we will be full. So we do have an issue on the ground that uh, it's full, and not only us, but most of the satellite that is covering Indonesia will be full. Sometimes. Uh, second half of next year. So we need, we have an issue, uh, uh, building satellite takes a long time, uh, but also a lot of people who wants to build a satellite will not be able to match the government uh, pricing because when we did the PPP, we set a new bar. Uh, it's a very, very low bar. It's gonna be not gonna be, some of them are not be interesting to do so. But that's the source. Uh, uh, of, of the government relocating the budget. Uh, it's not adding any more burden, not taking anything. It's actually coming from the telecom industry and the commercial industry itself. Uh, secondly, is that we are seeing a, a high single digit, a low double digit growth in traffic on a monthly basis. So we're racing now. And that's why the fiber is going to come and the even the uh, long range digital transmission is called uh, com terrestrial transmission is coming in place. So uh, we are experimenting with uh, the government, the Indonesian people are experimenting with a lot of uh, technology right now, uh, you name it and they try, uh, but a lot of them are not able to uh, become economically yet. And I, uh, I, we have been inundated by many 
uh, global players uh, because we're probably now the hottest market until they know the low price and they all get uh, concerned about it. Right. Um, and the other half of the equation that, that I noted in the ITU and uh, UN reports was the dearth of computers. Um, so that even if you have the potential for internet connectivity, if you don't have a device. So your, is your program, is it aligned with a comparable program to bring, um, uh, expand the distribution of computers, physical computers to the students and others or? Well, yes, that's the difference of uh, not a Minister of Communication, that's the Minister of Education. Okay. So uh, right now you can buy uh, a relatively cheap uh, pad, uh, which is cost about one hundred fifty dollars, and the Minister of Education is doing something to make that more achievable and more affordable, because under the Indonesian law, twenty percent of the government budget is for education, so they will have to redirect some of the situation now for COVID. They have enough yeah. money to do so. so. So it's not gonna be your iPad or something like that, but it's gonna be something not 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 a smartphone, but a, it's, a, it's a small pad maybe uh, uh, with your mini iPad or something like that. Uh, there's a lot of them in, in, the, in the range of less than $200. Yeah, yeah. My, my kids actually use iPads. And, and I will say that, that in terms of the even with their greater dexterity operating with their uh, with their iPhones, having a larger form factor, I think it's is is a great idea, and it does facilitate. Um, Renato, did you want to comment? Mm -hmm. Yes, just to add, on the one hand, with our national UK network, we find for traffic, we simply see the evening busy hour all through the day now. But globally, with satellites, something really significant happened, and that is many of our global enterprise customers said, the world is getting less certain. We have a duty of care for our own people and important need of continuity of our operations in various countries of the world. So we've seen a real growth with satellite connectivity that's deployable for disaster resilience. A real wow. growth. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. Um, scalability. I, I heard, read the other day the um, SIA, the uh, U.S. Satellite Industry Association annual report, um, recorded that there are fewer than 3 million satellite broadband customers, and I assume that's, that's um, consumer customers globally. 3 million. In May of this year, the UN released a report about COVID-19 in which they said that universal digital access is essential to bridge the digital divide, of course. And they noted that we have not the um, O3B, not the 3 billion, <laughs> but 3.6 billion people who remain offline worldwide. So we got 3 million satellites, um, satellite broadband connections um and there's 3.6 billion people that we need to, additional people that we need to connect so the question is this are we going to be able to see s substantial scaling in our industry to be able to make a, a real dent in the pent-up demand of the unserved people around the world um and meaningfully be able to contribute or are we going to still you know, into the foreseeable indefinite future, be really operating on the fringes um, and that the lion's share of the connectivity is going to be provided elsewhere. Adi, what's your perspective on that? Well, the issue is that 3.6 billion people may not be able to afford the normal tariff. So no matter what it is, you have to reach out to figure out both in technology and policy to make sure those are affordable. Uh, set one after that, you certainly have to have the way of getting your gadget into the hands of the people. It is easy to say uh, in Europe, five euro, in UK, five pounds, but that's the whole 
uh, income uh, of the people more in two days. Uh, so suddenly they are not interested to do that. But with, without thinking of getting them into digital uh, society, they will going to have a much bigger gap uh, in their social life, which will have been left. Uh, 3.6 billion people will never, never join the digital society. That is a cost to the world, whether through government or other means, uh, because as, as uh, modernizations or advances coming in, everything uh, needs to be a part of the internet. Uh, I, I also saw a chat from Renato. Yes, we have an issue on the electricity. Now is not mm. connectivity. Yes. It's now issue of electricity. That is a hell of a problem, which is we are not ready, but we are now. Mm. Fortunately, the solar panel and the batteries uh, are, are getting cheaper. We are not aiming to operate 24 hours a day. We're operating at a certain time to make sure yeah. the cost of the battery doesn't go beyond that. That's basically how we're trying to solve. And as technology comes in, we will be able to do more and more. Okay. Um, gentlemen, anyone else want to leap in here to comment on, on this? Mm -hmm. Can I ask you, Greg, with your company of GAPSAT, do you see a commercial opportunity here that GAPSAT could be part of solving? Well, um, as a matter of fact, yes. I mean, one of the things that, not to go into too much detail, but one of the, the um, focuses of our business from the beginning is filling the business gap of operators, other operators that need additional capacity to meet surge requirements. So in a time like, like we are facing now, where there is a need for more connectivity, um, we are among the go-to companies where you can obtain in-orbit capacity that can be moved to the orbital location that a satellite operator wants to operate at in order to serve specific markets and sub-markets. So, very much so. Um, and thank you for asking. We'll, we'll be taking orders after this uh, <laughs> after this. Session. Um, well, let's hope so. Um, we have to actually end our our panel now. I'm I'm sorry because we got a lot more. I have another five pages of questions, but we're never going to get to them. I want to say just I guess as a as a final word, I want to thank uh, Euroconsult for letting us do this session. I think that uh, we will all agree that the provision of universal access is really critical for all of humanity. And I think as we've seen here today, it's also good for the business of satellites and the satellite industry broadly. So I hope you got something out of it. And thank you so much. And gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us and for contributing and teaching us. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much, Thanks, Greg. Greg. Take care. Else. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. Please be Bye -bye. safe and keep healthy, please. All of us.